I got a comment a few weeks ago and it simply read, you spend all your time making tools, when do you actually use them? At the time, I pointed out that the purpose of this channel is simply to make science more accessible, and showing how to make otherwise impossible to buy tools is just as important as actually doing science. And that's true. But over the last few weeks, I've been talking to some friends about biohacking and citizen scientists and makers, specifically about the propensity to make things out of garbage and frame it as opening access when it's still just garbage. If you watch this channel, you know that I tend to make a lot of my own tools, so I wanted to take a day and talk about why I do that, and which things are worth building, and which are just worth buying. Over the past week, I attempted three different projects, and not a single one of them worked, largely because I was trying to do things by spending as little money as possible. But when you use garbage as a foundation, you likely just get garbage back out. There's a saying, a poor man can only afford to buy the best tool, because he can only afford to buy it once. And some of these are ones that I talked about at the end of earlier videos. First I tried the quantum entanglement project again, but with a 2.5 watt blue laser. Then I tried for second harmonic with a more powerful 1 watt infrared laser. And in both cases, nothing. Any guesses as to why? Because those lasers were cheap crap. Sure, they're powerful, but power without quality is just crap. So now I'm out the money I spent on them, and with nothing to show for it other than some burn marks on paper. Then I took a swing at sonoluminescence, since I already had most of the parts. Sonoluminescence is the process where you essentially vibrate water hard enough that little bubbles form and pop in a process called cavitation. And when they do that, it's so forceful that light comes out. In theory, it's simple. Just stick two ultrasound transducers to a flask, get a frequency generator, and pump it with as much power as you can, and tune to the resonant frequency of the flask. But the amplification step is critical. I tried making my own amp out of junk I had laying around, but that didn't work at all. So I bought a cheap amplifier, and again, nothing, because it was a cheap, crap amplifier. In all these cases, I didn't want to spend a little bit extra on quality because I wanted to try and get away with garbage. But I paid the price, and now I'll still have to buy the quality stuff, and it cost me more because I started with garbage. Now, it's not to say that building your own tools isn't warranted in some cases, but the key is knowing which things are worth building and which are worth buying. And I hope that I can make those mistakes for you and save you time and money in the process. Because if you spend all your time making your tools, you never actually use them. To borrow and paraphrase a line from a dear friend, if your chef made his own stove, cast his own skillet, forged his own knife, but can't cook an egg, you can have all the hipster smugness about how artisan and bespoke it is, but it's still a shitty egg. Often it's better to save up and just buy the tool if your goal is actually getting things done. Let's look at some examples from my channel to see some real world context. I try and only build things if the cost of buying them is simply too high or things can't be purchased. For example, a while back I modified a microscope so that it can do polarimetry. To buy a scope with that capability would cost upwards of $1,000, but the pieces required to turn any scope into a polarized scope cost pennies and took only minutes to do. That is a great example when building is better than buying. But do you know what I'm not going to try and build? The microscope itself. It would take too long and be lower quality than if I just spent a couple hundred bucks on a professionally made one. And to be fair, sometimes garbage does work. Just look at the TEA laser I built. But that's more of an exception to the rule than anything. Often the trade-off is one of time and money. More money means less time spent making stuff. But while it may be obvious to assume that those with less money have the time to spend making stuff instead of buying it, that is a terrible assumption. Those with less money have to work harder to stay afloat, so just saving up and throwing money at the issue actually balances out. And if you've got a monetary surplus, rather than showing how to make things out of garbage, you'd probably do more good by organizing a group buy of the item in question and distributing it. Another great example is Cogsworth or Pipsqueak. These are things that technically exist, but could cost tens of thousands of dollars to buy. I don't have the money to afford that, but I was able to build them because thanks to the amazing support of my patrons and now channel memberships, I have functionally infinite time. If I want to spend 21 hours a day building a giant robot, I have the luxury of doing that. It means I can spend the time troubleshooting and beating my head against the problem and hopefully solving issues and publishing plans so that if you want to build one yourself, the time cost is significantly less. For me, it's these sorts of projects that I feel are worth my time building. The ones that would take otherwise completely unreachable science and truly make it easier, lowering the barrier to entry. I want to make videos that drop both the time and money cost to allow anyone to make use of them. But even then, most people don't have access to the tools and supplies I had to build a project like Pipsqueak. And that leads me to my next point. There's this growing desire to have every tool and build a cave of all the possible toys, to which I say, fuck that. There's a reason that when I landed in Montreal, I chose not to build myself a lab again, and instead set up in a local community space. I'm sick of hoarding my tools. If you think about how many people on your street probably all own the same tools, the reasoning starts to come into focus. 
If instead of everyone buying themselves an angle grinder, they all just shared, everyone gets the benefit of a massive multitude of tools at a fraction of the cost. Sure, this means you need to share, but you made it through first grade, so I'm sure you were taught how to do that. For me, getting set up at Food Lab has been a blessing the likes of which I can't properly sum up. Not only did I instantly get access to a plethora of tools and materials at a tiny fraction of the cost, I also get the experience and expertise of everyone else there. For every question I could have, there's usually two to three people that not only have the answer, they also have the experience with the thing in question and know the potential roadblocks and places where it's easy to slip up. In return, I share my experience on the things they don't know, and together the projects that become tackleable is nearly unmatched. If we wanted to put a satellite in orbit, there is no question in my mind that we could do it collectively, whereas if I was asked to do that on my own, it would be functionally impossible. I know I'm not infallible, and I've made these mistakes many times over the years, and even recently. I've spent time where I should have spent money, I've hoarded tools, and I've spent money where I should have spent time. So it's my hope that as I move forward and continue to work on projects, I can further refine my understanding of that balance, and hopefully share what I learn with all of you. Rather than showing how to make everything from garbage, I think the more important conversation is one of teaching which things are worth buying, which are worth buying used and fixing, and which are actually worth building. So from now on, I'm going to make a significant effort to make that delineation more clear, and I hope that those with similar skill sets will help do the same. I want to close out with two recommendations, and the first is for a book. It's by Cory Doctorow, and it's called Walk Away. It's a fantastic book that I honestly can't recommend enough, but since I read it, it's really been lingering in my mind a lot. The main focus of Walk Away is the concept that we live in a world of post-scarcity abundance. Today there is a glut of tools and materials, and most of it's thrown away when it's still perfectly good or easily fixable. It's that exact reason that things like biohacking are becoming more and more popular. As labs throw out their tools, people like me and my friends scoop them up. In the end, a heat block, PCR machine, or incubator are the same as they were in 1970, but the rep from Biorad convinced some PI that they need a new one with a shiny new outer shell, touchscreen, and app. I'll happily just settle for a button and a dial if the machine works. In Walkaway, they have the benefit of pseudo-magical 3D printers that can take in all of this scrap and turn it into anything. We aren't there yet, so our magic 3D printers are time, money, and community. In Walkaway, they change the world by forgoing greed and leaning into a sharing economy, and I think that's something worth striving for. So if your area doesn't have a community space like Food Lab, get some friends together and make one. It'll be very hard work, as keeping a place like this afloat is a very real challenge, and the path to success is marred by roadblocks that can only be overcome by sheer force of will, blood, sweat, tears, and a bit of luck. But in the end, if you make it work, it's absolutely worth it. If nothing else, check your local area and see if a space like this already exists. And next time you want to do a project, maybe help them grow rather than making your treasure pile taller. The last recommendation is an article that my friend Gabriel Lucina just put out, which I think does an amazing job of summing up this whole concept of garbage-flavored garbage, and the need for a change in how we deal with things in the various hacker and maker communities, especially when the goal is to do science and not just make our tools. I've put a link in the description. Please give it a read if you've got a spare moment. I think it's an important one to at least read once. And for now, that's where I'm going to leave it. I know this video was a bit different from the usual fare, so we'll be getting back to the great science stuff next week and doing some genetic modification, but this was one I needed to get out of my mind. I hope you enjoyed it, or it at least made you think, and I'll see you next week.